Hey, what's up, Inside Out? Yes. Welcome to Back to School Bash. If this is your first time at Inside Out, welcome. Uh, if you haven't yet, at some point tonight, make sure you stop by the first time area, get your free t-shirt, get connected. I hope that you have an incredible night to the point it makes you want to come back again. And if we have not met before, my name is Beth and I'm excited for where we are headed tonight. Uh, and in honor of our theme of Back to School Bash being a theme park, I am curious who in the room would say that you're a fan of, of this place right here? It's gonna show up. Who's a fan? Okay, some of you. Would any of you, would any of you put yourself in like, you're the like Disney obsessed category? Any of you, I'm getting, okay, a few of you. There's a few hands. I feel like the Disney obsession, it's, it's real. And now I, I will admit that personally, I don't totally understand it. I, I've also only been to Disney one time. It's when I was like six years old. So I only have like faint memory of it. So maybe if I just like went more as an adult, I don't know, maybe it would like reignite the magic of Disney. I don't totally get it, but I know people that like they're obsessed. The love of Disney is real. I've seen videos where people cry meeting some of the characters for the first time. People celebrate major life milestones in Disney World, like people get engaged, people uh, go there for their honeymoon. I know a family who waited to give their child their first haircut until they had a trip booked to Disney so that their kid could get their first haircut in a salon in Disney World. Like the love and the passion is there. And here's what I've learned about people who love Disney. Or really honestly, Let's insert like anything that people are passionate about. Like any of you have friends or maybe yourself like obsessed, love, passionate about CrossFit. Or maybe there's some of you who are like UGA. You are die hard UGA fans. You're, you're passionate about it. You love it. You're obsessed with it. Or some of you, uh, uh, the love and obsession for Taylor Swift. To any of those people in the room, a few of you, okay. You guys are even, just as you're talking, you're chatting, you're like proving my point, that when somebody loves something, when they're passionate about something, even maybe borderline obsessed with something, like they're pretty vocal about it. Like people who love Disney and insert anything else, like are obsessed with a certain sports team. I feel like the Taylor Swift following, like you know, that these people have a passion and a love for that thing. They don't hide that piece of themselves at all. They're pretty vocal about it. And normally when there's something that you love, something that you're passionate about, like you want other people to get in on it. And chances are like, you know what your friends love most, you know what they're passionate about and, and they probably know what you love and they probably know what you're passionate about because if they don't love that same thing, you've probably tried to get them on board with whatever that thing is at some point. Because when we love something, when it's meaningful to us, when it's important to us, when we're passionate about it, we don't hide it, we're pretty vocal about it. And that's true of most things in our life. But for a portion of us in the room, I would say there's probably something in our life that, that we would maybe say that we're passionate about. We would say is pretty important in our life, but it tends to be an area of our life that we keep pretty quiet. We keep pretty private. And if you're a follower of Jesus in the room, I would hope that you would say that your faith is the most important thing about you. That it's something that, that you care about, that you're passionate about. But oftentimes what happens is when it comes to our faith, we keep quiet. And I get this. I get doing this because the reality is like, I do this too. Like I'm the one that's gonna be standing on stage tonight talking about faith and, and even I can fall into keeping my faith quiet. I mean, a few years ago we went on a, a family trip to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And while we were out there, we decided to do a few different excursions. One of them was horseback riding and one of them was whitewater rafting. And when you go on these excursions, you're grouped with a whole bunch of strangers that you've never met before. And there's a tour guide. And, and on both times, the tour guide was like, hey, I want everybody to get to know each other. Everybody just say like your name, where you're from and what your job is. 
And anytime I'm in a group of strangers and they ask, what's your job? I like panic a little. I like die a little bit inside. Because the minute I'm in a group full of strangers and I have to say that, that my job is a pastor, that for my job, I work at a church, immediately everyone gets weird. Like it just gets super awkward. Everyone gets uncomfortable. Everyone gets quiet. You can see people starting to like think back of like, okay, what have I said in this conversation? Like, have I said a cuss word? Have I said something offensive? Like, have I done something weird? And every time in those moments, I just wanna be like, I'm normal. And I promise like, I'm not judging you. But even me, somebody that like, I'm like a professional Christian, like I've dedicated my life to this because I think it's that important. Even I can fall into the temptation that outside of the walls of the church, I keep quiet about my faith. And if you would consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, it's probably just more comfortable that way. It's easier to just keep quiet about your faith, to keep that part of your life private. Well, because it can feel vulnerable to talk about it. And sure, maybe it's important to you, but like not everybody else needs to know that. And man, it could put your reputation and your friendships at stake. And so it feels a lot easier to just keep it to yourselves. And then there may be others of you in the room where you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're figuring out exactly what it is that you believe. Or maybe you're just here tonight because your friend was like, bro, you gotta show up so that I can get a free t-shirt. And you're like, I don't totally know like what I'm showing up to, but like, here I am. And you hear this and your thought is, I don't know, I actually would kind of prefer if Christians would just stay quiet about their faith. Like I actually think, think things would be better if people just, stayed quiet, kept their faith to themselves. And I completely get that way of thinking because there's been a lot of Christians who are very vocal that have done a pretty bad job of displaying Christianity. I mean, have you ever gone to an event or a game at like Mercedes Benz or State Farm and there's been the people on the corner like preaching and yelling at the crowds walking in? Like if you've ever experienced that where they're just being like incredibly judgmental and telling everyone like, you're gonna go to hell and telling them exactly what to believe. And you're like, this is awkward. Like this is uncomfortable. I want no part of this. Or have you ever had uh, people knock on your door at your house to like want to like share their faith with you at your house? Like we had that growing up and I remember like we'd get the knock on the door and every, we'd be like, turn off the lights, everybody hide. Like just act like nobody's home because it's weird. It's uncomfortable. And in those moments, it doesn't make you curious about faith. If anything, it makes you want to avoid the faith that these people are proclaiming. And so while I get wanting to keep our faith to ourselves, I experience it too. The reality is that none of us would be in this room today if it weren't for some early believers who could not keep quiet about their faith. If you were inside out last week, Darren kicked off a brand new series for us where we're going through the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is all about how what we know now as the church first began. In the book of Acts, it takes place after Jesus has been crucified and he's resurrected. And then he gathers it together, his believers, and he tells them, hey, I'm going back to heaven and it's now up to you to continue this movement of faith going. And that's how the church is launched. And tonight, I want us to pay attention to what those early believers did to keep that movement of faith going. And so to do that, we're gonna be in Acts chapter four. Sorry. <coughs> we're gonna be in Acts chapter four. Uh, but before we dive into where we're going, a little bit of context of what's happening. So there are Peter and John, who are two of Jesus's apostles, which just means they're two of the people that have been challenged with launching the church. And Peter and John, they have encountered a man who isn't able to walk and they heal this man. And it causes a lot of attention. People are drawn to it. They're asking questions. And as a result, Peter and John are arrested. 
and they're brought before these highly religious, highly educated leaders in authority. And these guys in authority, they have the power with just one word to have Peter and John killed. So at the time, the name of Jesus, the, the movement of Jesus is created a lot of tension. And those who are in power and authority, they're threatened by this move of Jesus. And so Peter and John, before those in authority, they're asked, under whose name or in what power have you healed this man? And in this moment, Peter and John, they could choose to be quiet. They, they could choose to not say anything and honestly just protect themselves. That's not what they choose to do. Acts chapter four, starting in verse eight, says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And so in this moment, Peter doesn't just tell them that, that, that they've healed this man in the name of Jesus. He takes the opportunity to tell them exactly who Jesus is. That Jesus was crucified and resurrected from the dead. That Jesus is the cornerstone, meaning he is the foundation of life, the structure, the thing that holds life itself together and that he is the only name in which salvation can be found. In a moment of boldness and courage, he takes the opportunity to share with those in authority the truth that he has come to know in Jesus. But it's important to note that, that Peter doesn't just do this within his own strength. No, it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God with us. God's spirit that works in us and through us when we place our faith in Jesus. And it's that spirit that gives Peter the courage and the boldness to speak up about who Jesus is. And after Peter responds this way, here is the response of those in authority. Verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It's because of this boldness and this courage that they present in this moment, those in authority who are skeptical of Jesus, who are unsure of Jesus, who, who, who maybe don't know if they believe in him, but they're certainly threatened by his power and authority because of the courage and the boldness that Peter has, they can't help but to deny that, that certainly these men have been with Jesus and that there is power in that name. And they don't believe it because they're like overly articulate or they have all this knowledge or they're coming across really smart with all this wisdom. No, they believe that and they think that simply because of the boldness and the courage that Peter and John have in this moment. To the point where those in authority, they don't know what to do with them. They don't know what to do with Peter and John, but they know that they want this movement of Jesus to stop. They want it to end. And so they tell Peter and John, they tell them, okay, you can go, but just stop teaching. Stop preaching. Stop telling about people about this Jesus that you know. But then here is their response to that. Later in verse 20, they say, but as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Peter and John's response is that they can not stop talking about Jesus. 
And they can't stop talking about Jesus because of what they had experienced firsthand. You see, Peter and John, they knew Jesus personally. They had walked with Jesus. They had been a part of all of his years of ministry when he was on earth. And then they, they saw Jesus crucified on a cross. And then they witnessed Jesus resurrect from the dead three days later. And they came to the conclusion that if all of this was true, then, then surely this really was the son of God. That surely in this man is where salvation is found. They knew because they had spent time, personal time with Jesus, had walked with Jesus, that he was worth following, that, that he was worth building their life on. They knew that in Jesus is where they found peace. It's where they found hope. It's where they found freedom. It's where they found confidence. They believed that, that he was worth dedicating their lives to. And because of the way that Jesus had transformed their lives, because of the power that they had experienced in Jesus, they could not stop talking about it. And that is the theme that you see all throughout the book of Acts. That over and over again through this book of Acts, there's actually one word that's written like 39 different times throughout this book. That over and over and over again, it talks about how these early believers, that they were a witness to the power of Jesus. And then they went to go be a witness to others about the power and the transformation that they had experienced. And it was this willingness to go witness, to go and tell the world about what they had seen and heard that the church, that this movement of faith, this following of Jesus exploded around the world. And even if you're just to look in the first four chapters of Acts, in just the first four chapters, it's written, the 3,000 were added to their number in one day. Later in the same chapter, it's written that the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. And then in chapter four, after Peter and John healed this man who can't walk, it says that those who believed grew to about 5,000. The reason that I know about Jesus, the reason that we're sitting in this room today and you are hearing about Jesus is because there was a group of early believers who could not stop talking about what they had seen and what they had heard. And this movement, this movement of faith, this movement of Jesus followers, it continues to grow when we choose to not be silent about what we have seen and what we have heard. And so inside out, my question for you is have you witnessed it? Have you witnessed it? Have you witnessed the peace of Jesus in your life? Have you witnessed the goodness of Jesus in your life? Have you witnessed the healing of Jesus in your life? Have you witnessed the freedom of Jesus in your life? Have you witnessed the love of Jesus in your life? Have you witnessed the forgiveness of Jesus in your life? Have you witnessed the power of Jesus in your life? Have you witnessed the faithfulness of Jesus in your life? And have you witnessed the saving grace of Jesus in your life? If you have, then your life should bear witness to the world about what you have seen and heard. I mean, if you have been a witness, go be a witness. And this isn't always with our words. We should definitely use our words, but it's with our life, it's with our actions, it's with our decisions, it's the way that we carry ourselves. But if your life in any way, shape or form has been transformed by the power of Jesus, then you should have a belief and a hope that he can transform the lives around you and you should want everyone to know about what you have seen, what you have heard, and what you have witnessed when it comes to the power of Jesus. And can it be uncomfortable to share your faith, to talk about your faith, to live this out? Absolutely. Because our faith, it's personal. And it can feel really vulnerable to talk about it, but it's worth it. 
And could your reputations and your friendships be at stake? Sure. But for the early believers, it was their lives that were at stake. I mean, people were being killed for believing in Jesus and they still could not stop talking about what they had seen and what they had heard. And they couldn't stop talking about it because they believed that Jesus, the truth of Jesus, the news of Jesus was the greatest news that the world could ever know. And they believed that they had the power of the Holy Spirit working in them and through them and it compelled them to go and tell the world. And so if you have been a witness, go be a witness. But if you're in the room tonight and you don't personally know Jesus, and for some of this, this is like the first time that, that, that you're hearing about some of this, man, I want you to know about Jesus that has transformed my life. I, I want you to know about the Jesus that has transformed the lives of so many people in this room. And so if you've walked in tonight and you are like void of peace, looking for peace, can I tell you that Jesus is the source of that? And if you're in the room and you're wondering like, what does love actually look like? Well, you can look to Jesus to know exactly what love looks like. If you're in a place where you're looking at your life and things just feel like they are falling apart and the way that you're living, it's not working and you're at the point of maybe just wanting to give up, can I tell you that Jesus offers you something better? that in Him is life itself. In Him is all that we need. In Him is new life. If you've walked in wondering where can I belong, can I tell you that you belong with Jesus? That Jesus is the Son of God who is fully God and fully man who came to earth to show us what our heavenly Father is like. And then he died a death that we deserve for the forgiveness of our sin. And sin, it's anything that's less than God's holiness, God's glory. It's, it's anything that breaks the relationship with God, that, that breaks the relationship with other people. We are all sinners in need of a savior. And Jesus has offered us salvation in his name. In him is everything that we need. And that Jesus wants to know you personally. That Jesus wants to transform your life. That Jesus wants to make you new. That Jesus wants to give you a hope and a freedom and a confidence and a peace and a joy that cannot be found anywhere else. And if you don't know Jesus, but you want to know Him, then I wanna give you the opportunity to know Him tonight. And knowing Him, Placing your faith in Him, it's not that complicated. In fact, it's written out for us in Romans 10, verse nine. It simply says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. And so if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, but you believe that in Jesus is your salvation, and you believe that, it, that he died on the cross for your sins and then rose again declaring that sin and death would no longer have a hold on us. If you believe that and you've never placed your faith in him, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that tonight. And so with every eye closed, head bowed, if you wanna place your faith in Jesus for the first time tonight, will you just simply pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, know that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I trust you as that savior. I surrender my life to you. From this point forward, I wanna follow you in all my ways. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'm gonna ask you to have a moment of boldness and courage. And I'm not gonna force you to do this, but if tonight you have seen and heard for the first time the goodness 
of Jesus and have placed your faith in him for the first time, I don't want now to be the start of you being quiet about what you have seen and what you've heard. And I truly believe with all of my heart that when we place our faith in Jesus, that all of heaven celebrates that a child has come home. And so it would be a miss to not celebrate that in this room. And so if you placed your faith in Jesus tonight, would you just have the boldness and the courage to stand in this room? Do you just have the boldness and the courage to stand up? Anyone gonna do it? Anyone gonna have the boldness and the courage to say, hey, I have placed my faith in Jesus? Anyone in here? Anyone for the first time? Come on, come on. Anyone else knowing that you're not alone? There you go, come on. There's two more. Yeah. (laughs) Can we take a moment to acknowledge what just happened? That it took one step one step of boldness and courage for other people to have the boldness and the courage to declare that they are a follower of Jesus. Man, that is what it is about. And for those of you in the room who placed your faith in Jesus for the first time tonight, can I tell you that you will never regret this decision. That there is a life offered to you found in Jesus that you cannot find anywhere else. So if you would, would you one more time celebrate those in the room that have had the boldness and the courage to declare that they are a follower of Jesus. You guys can have a seat. But for all of us in the room, we just witnessed the goodness and the power of Jesus. I mean, that should compel us to go live our lives differently. And so for the rest, of you in the room. Whether you placed your faith in Jesus tonight or you placed your faith in Jesus when you were a kid or you placed your faith in Jesus when we were in Daytona this summer, I have a challenge for you. And my challenge for you is is would, would this be the school year? Would this be the year that you would commit to saying, I'm going to go live differently? I'm going to go live boldly and courageously as a witness of the Jesus that I claim to follow. Would this be the year that you would let your words, your actions and the decisions that you make reflect the power and the life transformation that you have experienced in Jesus? And if you're gonna commit to that, I'm gonna ask you to stand, but I don't want you to stand just because your friends are standing. I want you to stand because you're ready to take this seriously, that you are willing to say, I want this year to be a different year and I have been a witness to the power of Jesus and I'm willing to go be a witness of the power of Jesus so that this movement of faith, this movement of Jesus continues to grow. If you're willing to commit to that this year, will you stand? Yes. I want you guys to look around the room. If this whole room, if you went and you lived as a witness to what you have seen and heard, if you would be willing to share the way that Jesus has transformed your life, if you would be willing to to not hide your faith in order to fit in, but you would be willing to stand out, to live differently, to act differently, to talk differently, to let the world know that you are a follower of Jesus. Can you imagine what would happen if that many people said yes to doing that? Things would change. This city would look different. This room would start to look different. We'd have to find a new place to meet because of the way that this movement would begin to explode. And inside out, I believe that the move of Jesus, it continues with you. And so if you have been a witness, go be a witness and let's go tell the world about Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father. 
God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for those in the room tonight who place their faith in you for the very first time. God, we thank you for their hearts and their lives that, that are transformed and for the goodness that they will find in you. And God, I pray for this room that as they're launching into a new school year, that God, that this would be the year that they would be committed to living differently that inside out would be known, that it would would be marked as a group of people who love you and want to live our lives with you fully on display. So God, would you give us the courage to be bold and courageous? Would you give us the courage to live differently, to act differently so that we can bear witness to the power and the glory and the goodness and the faithfulness of who you are? Father, we love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.